actually not true. And uh, some people believe, and that's probably well, due to the vendors in the past, that they always sell you a box. And uh, if you need a, a firewall, then you need some box you have to plug in somewhere. Uh, and that is not actually true. It, it's true in some ways if, if you blend it, uh, implement it as a uh, reverse proxy or something like that. But uh, most of the time, you actually don't need hardware. You don't need to change the network. Um, so, and of course, the, the targeted audience for this. So, it's technical decision makers. It, it's not deep down technical or dirty technical paper. Uh, it uh, it aims to the technical decision makers, people uh, people for responsible for operations on the uh, whole thing, and security of course, and application owners. So it could be some project manager at the very least, or some guy who just raised the hand at the wrong location and said, "Yeah, we could do it using a web application if I write it in." Yeah. And everybody said, "Yeah, you do it." It's like the Oberst uh, uh, spirit here, yeah. <laughs> and then. <coughs> Okay, characteristics of application uh, uh, with regards to security. Um, we divide that into two uh, subtopics. One is the higher level aspects in the company. Um, and they are basically prioritizing uh, applications in regard to their importance. Um, and uh, that hasn't to do with uh, technical stuff at all. You just look at your applications. Um, so we have customers, they say, well, we have a thousand web applications running all over the company. It's a big corporate. So uh, where should we start, actually? And uh, this gives you uh, a small outline. And you can say, OK, uh, access to personal customer data, for example. Uh, just if, you, if, if you've got a tick there, then it should be one of the first applications you deal with. Uh, or access to confidential company, uh, company information. Uh, that is also one, basically, because if you do that, and you have a problem with this, you've got a big image problem if you have a security issue. <coughs> and uh, certifications. Um, if you need them, then you actually have to implement them if they require a replication firewall or web replication security in some point. Um, and then the technical aspects, of course, uh, um, testing quality assurance stuff. So um, you you make sure that you actually start with the security right in the development using some static source code analysis tools. Uh, there, there are a few good uh, uh, tools around. And um, uh, if the tools work correctly and they do their job really good, they should actually help you getting a rule set for application firewall out of the box. So you don't need to know the application very much uh, from a security point of view because the uh, uh, static source code analysis tool is able to give you uh, basically a baseline protection for your application. And um, uh, you can refine that later, if you like, if you, or even during the development process. Uh, one more important thing is if you have undocumented systems running around, um, they also get up and not down in the uh, priority list. Because if they are undocumented, they probably have some hidden feature. Uh, so some secret admin panel. I've seen lots of those things flying around, and it's, it's just amazing. Or if you use SAP, for example, um, it's very well documented somehow. But uh, if you read uh, further down the documentation or the appendixes, you see basically URLs popping up all over the place, uh, giving you the, the power to change the SAP portal in a very integral part. And uh, this is a big problem because most of the developers uh, implementing a portal uh, don't know that. They don't go far as, as far down in the documentation and say, well, uh, uh, here I can uh, set the master password for some default admin, which is always there. So if you have SAP somewhere and they use SAP portal, there's a default admin with a default password. Uh, actually, it's not, it's not even set the password. The first time you go there, uh, it says, ah, you're a portal admin. Uh, password has not been set. Uh, set it now, please. And every user could do that. But uh, you don't need it, actually, to, to set up a portal to get it up and running. You have got different admin privileges. And this is just uh, a an, an special admin which has well, too many capabilities to change stuff in SAP uh, with its own account uh, from uh, the web <coughs> interface. <coughs> so and uh, have a look at vendor contracts. So if they provide you with security somehow, then use it or abuse it. Okay, then uh, 
Next one was the, the overview, because this is always very mystical around the application firewalls. Uh, vendors in the past promised everything basically from heaven. And uh, uh, open source projects uh, kind of promise everything to you, but they, uh, uh, if you look like it, uh, they give you guidance a lot and they give you default rule sets you can download and implement and things like that. And uh, most of the time people just say, oh, new rule set, just download it, implement it. Ah, it's blocking something important. Hmm. Turn off that rule without looking into the rule. Just turn it off basically and then uh, it goes on and on and, and your uh, rule set basically dies out to really unimportant rules which just uh, performance, you have a performance impact into you and you actually don't need them. It's like you go to the doctor and say, well, um, I'm going to Alaska now and uh, I need injections against all diseases you have because I've never been to Alaska and there might be some weird stuff around uh, which is gonna bite me and I'm probably gonna die. So give me injections, all of them. <laughs> um, and uh, you, you obviously don't need that because there's probably no CC fly uh, in Alaska which is gonna bite you and you die. <coughs> okay, so. Question. Yes. You, you talked about the SAP example in the uh, last slide. So, one, one of the things when I look at web application firewall, it's kind of a use case for me to start with for the external facing application. Mm -hmm. So, when you say SAP, are, are you talking about those internal ones? I'm, I'm talking about external and internal. Um, the, the, the admin thing is actually an, an external problem, oh. SAP problem. Uh, and. Uh, <laughs> Uh, it's quite dangerous if you don't uh, actually disable that account. And, um, but in a big corporation, there's no inside and outside anymore. You've got interns coming from all over the world working for you. So um, are they inside or are they outside? Basically, they are outside more or less because they are learning stuff and things like that, but they have access to uh, the corporate network and that's behind the firewall, the network firewall. So. Uh, and more and more applications have been uh, changed from some desktop application into a web application uh, facing basically somewhere on the network and then you can access it from the corporate network. So it's not just uh, anymore uh, the problem of uh, I need the software to install it to actually do my work somewhere. Uh, that was the past. Now you just open your browser and go to, to the page, log in somehow or not and <laughs> do your work. <coughs> so. Um, where do application files actually fit? So they are only, uh, only a part of a uh, solution. So they are not the solution at all. And you just, if, uh, if, buddy, if anybody tells you you've got a security problem, just implement a buff and you're fine, then they're actually lying to you. Um, there are problems which can't be dealt with uh, the application firewalls. Uh, and uh, you have to deal them in another way. And uh, uh, we explain uh, in that section also about uh, the main benefits of a WAF, what, what things you can do, uh, and additional functionality you actually don't have to implement uh, if you use a WAF, like, for example, uh, URL encryption. You can do that in the uh, application or in every application, use a framework or whatever, uh, and do it uh, by hand, do some legwork, or you just uh, enable a feature in a application firewall which says encrypt all, uh, URLs coming from the application. And uh, the uh, thing is, <coughs> uh, if the vendor tells you it's just a switch, he's partly true. Because if you have a complicated application using Flash and JavaScript, the URL uh, may be constructed in the browser. So uh, if the web doesn't have an API to, to give you the power basically to jump into that script and rearrange stuff in there, then uh, it's worthless to you. You can't use that feature. <coughs> okay, and uh, uh, next thing is, what can be achieved with uh, application firewalls? So it's big table uh, with, uh, uh, in brackets, wanted functionality. Uh, it's like your business uh, functionality you want out of a uh, application firewall, and it goes by examples like cost guides, request forgery, session fixation, some whatever injection, SQL injection, LDAP injection, XML, XPath injection, uh, and things like that. And uh, uh, there's a rating next to these. So um, uh, if you see the plus next in on, on that table, it can be very well implemented using a replication firewall. Uh, uh, with a minus, it can't be implemented. Uh, 
uh, exclamation mark says it depends on the application uh, or, or the rough or the requirements you have. Uh, and um, the last one is basically it can be partly implemented in rough. Uh, yeah, just go to the paper. It, it, 45 minutes is just not enough. It, it would cover basically three hours going yeah. through all the table and explain all necessary things. <coughs> and I would just also, as a follow-up, if it can be well implemented by the firewall, are you adjusting your other controls in terms of, for that particular vulnerability, we don't um, use uh, either source code analysis as heavily or... Uh, Depends. We, uh, we don't include it as part of our protocol for our vulnerability scanning. Yeah. This is actually up to you because uh, we were thinking of uh, writing an, uh, uh, like an advisory what you actually should do. But it turns out in different parts of the world, people deal with different uh, measures to a problem. In Asia, for example, they say, well, we're too busy. We just fix it in the rough, put it on a, uh, on a to-do list. And if we have time, maybe we fix it in the future. At the moment, we are secure. In Germany, there's the engineering mind, which says, oh, uh, if we have to, then we fix it in the rough, but only if we have to. But we definitely have to fix it in the source code, regardless if there's a new version next week or whatever. It has to be fixed now. And uh, in America, it's kind of uh, depends on company policy, mm -hmm. really. How many times do you want to look for a CSRA? Yes, exactly. <laughs> So you have to uh, see it from f uh, different angles, really. And so we thought we can write it as a, as a German paper, and that would be very straight. And like uh, uh, we've got a form for everything in Germany. So you have to fill that out first <laughs> and then get a stamp on that. And uh, once you've got that, then you're fine. But uh, it, I think it's not the aim of the paper. Okay. <laughs> um, so uh, then benefits and risks of uh, application firewalls, we have to look at that. So main benefit of a uh, application firewall basically is it gives you a good baseline security because uh, um, <coughs> you can get uh, uh, signatures from vendors. They do all the legwork for you, uh, uh, catching SQL injection stuff, and they try to get uh, uh, cross-site scripting and things like this. And uh, they've got labs and guys working on that when they normally know what they're doing. So you can benefit of that knowledge really easily. Then compliance, if you uh, fall under the PCI uh, DSS regulation, uh, you, got, you have to be compliant, just implement it. At the moment, it just tells you uh, that you need one. You actually have to switch it on. And it, you don't need a rule set for that. It doesn't define that if you enable any rule set. It says you have to take care of cross-site scripting. Blah, blah, blah. But if, you, if somebody comes and looks at the, the whole thing, uh, they say, OK, what did you do about cross-site scripting? And then you can go to the application and say, look, it's the application firewall. It has a switch for cross-site scripting. It has not yet switched on, but uh, we're going to in the future. And uh, the guy uh, auditing you says, OK, <laughs> at the moment. <coughs> and uh, just in time patching of problems. So if you have a problem with one form, for example, input field or something like that, you can fix that really easily. So additional benefits. Uh, I mentioned already um, dual encryption. If you have an uh, appliance basically on the front, um, you could use it uh, as an SSL termination point or SSL acceleration point, whatever you like. Uh, there are a few features uh, you can use which are quite good for you. Um, you've got a, a central reporting and error logging uh, facility basically if you uh, implement a VAF because everything goes through that. Um, this uh, is for obviously for, for appliances as well as for um, uh, software-based solutions, if they are cluster aware. Okay, and... Uh, one, one question on the just-in-time patching. So did you kind of look at or uh, study any vendor Yeah, so um, 
uh, most of the time, uh, if they don't use or well, change major numbers, um, you're normally fine. Um, you can actually re uh, read uh, the release notes for the security patches and say they fixed this, this, this. And if you have a contract with them, they also uh, tell you the dirty t uh, details about that. Uh, normally they say, well, fixed I injection problem uh, in form whatever. Yeah? That's very detailed information for them. But if you, uh, you actually have to ask what form is it and uh, what variable in the form. And uh, they tell you if you, a, if you have a support contract. If you don't, they just say, well, buy a support contract. And then you can patch it and uh, um, have peace of mind, more or less. The first thing you should do <coughs> actually is go to your test system, install the patch, and uh, try actually what they try to fix. There was one occasion uh, I was working on a project with SAP, and uh, uh, they had a uh, buffer overflow problem. So uh, to demonstrate that, I, I put in around a thousand A's on my on my keyboard, and said, well, if you press now enter, it just blows up in your face. And if you do it the right way, basically you can do um, command injection. Uh, yeah, not command injection. You can do trigger buffer overflow and go stack up and down and, and just own the box. It just takes some time. And uh, they came out with a patch, basically, uh, so it fixed it more or less for the thousand A's, but uh, it didn't fix it for the thousand B's. I tried next. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, the patch wasn't any good, really. So um, test it. Um, I wouldn't believe them most of the time. <laughs> OK, so risks uh, involved in using a replication firewall. Uh, one big risk is the false positive. Uh, which uh, denies you business, good business. Somebody tries to press the submit button on this big order and uh, he gets in 4.3 denied or something like that, forbidden. And uh, this is a big risk. Uh, and in increased complexity, of course, because you, you add another thing to your application, network, whatever you like, infrastructure, and uh, the complexity goes up. So. Uh, the problem sometimes is that uh, if you have, you have to implement security, people not, are not working together to begin with. They just say, the application developers say, well, we write secure code, so um, we're using some source code static analysis tools as well, so we are secure. Uh, but uh, they can only help you that much, basically, all the tools. And um, <coughs> the... Uh, the guys in charge of running the application, they just have a big on and off switch, more or less. They say, uh, okay, uh, we are secure because we've got a, uh, a network firewall in front of it. And uh, uh, they know that port 80 or 403 is open, but uh, from their point of view, uh, they're secure. And um, you have to get those guys all on one table and keep them talking, basically. Sense, <laughs> not senseless, it's not my business. Sometimes they say just, uh, let do the app, uh, app development team to uh, deal with that problem, and the app development deal, uh, 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 um, team says, well, that's security. The security team should deal with that. And uh, they just keep uh, pushing the ball around, and um, you need somebody in charge of actually dealing with that. I'll come to that later. And uh, you've got another thing. This is yet another proxy if you use that appliance. It's just another thing to your network. And uh, you've got potential side effects. Uh, uh, if the uh, replication firewall terminates actually some connection, what happens to the open session? Uh, does the application terminate the session after, or the timeout the session after nobody clicked the logout button or something? <coughs> really simple things to start with. Or if you have uh, a really strict uh, rules like uh, um, in a uh, banking application, if you have to type in some PIN or TAN number to, to uh, approve your um, tr uh, money transfer. <coughs> you could set up a rule which says only pins with four or three digits are allowed. Uh, and what do you do if there are more than four digits? You could block the traffic. But the end user will be presented a four or three denied or whatever or some error page. And he doesn't know what went wrong. Actually, the, the right way to do it would be that the application tells you this is uh, not a valid pin. But you can use it as a last resort if the application is not capable of doing it. Then you can employ a, a replication firewall rule to, to help you. Uh, just 
I would call it in, in, in time packaging then and fix the problem in the application later. This is the right way to do it. Can you talk about um, the use of logging versus blocking or can slowing down traffic as a mix of options? Or do you skip, do you skip assuming blocking? Not always. It depends on uh, the application firewall you buy. Some, t some of them have uh, uh, something like a shadow rule set. It's just logging stuff. Uh, but um, some of them can't actually do it. They just need to do some action, and action involves blocking. You can employ uh, some, some whatever you call it, non-action, for example, some bogus HTTP request, which a uh, uh, response which goes back to the to the device, telling it whatever HTTP instead of 200, okay, it says 999, and uh, there's a special way to deal with 999s, and they just keep on doing whatever they do in, in, uh, in the application flow. So they don't output any site. It's just a redirect of the site again or something like that. <coughs> so that's part of the answer to my question, but do you have any thoughts on mitigating the risk of false positives? I mean, one is if you're going in a logging mode, see what that Yeah, right? yeah. What you actually should do is uh, you should uh, use some uh, baseline security, uh, run it in logging mode to begin with for a few weeks. And uh, after that, if you ruled out every false positives in the baseline security, uh, get that live, and then uh, if the application firewall has some learning mode, activate the learning mode, and uh, look at what the output of that learning mode is. If that's any good, basically, put that into the logging mode, keep looking for, for problems, uh, and fix them, and uh, refine your, your, uh, your rule set, basically, step by step. Uh, everybody telling you that uh, you just put something in, put a, switch, a magical switch on, and do some magical learning, it's not going to work, definitely. It's sooner or later, it's going to be uh, blocking some legitimate traffic. And oh. nobody knows why that's the problem, because it was magic to begin with. Yeah, so, yeah. so performance and uh, within the risk, when, so I'm actually working on operationalizing some of the application firewalls in other environments. So two biggest things which I'm getting from IT team or the networking team, one is the performance thing, right? How much performance degradation this is going to do? Because already like there are so many applications, there are things, right? Uh, let's see if you put another thing in the mix. And, uh, also, it depends on basically the, the, the vendor and uh, what you have. If you have a, a single point where everything flows through, you have to scale that right to begin with. You have to make sure that actually that point scales in the future because y you're not nothing is in on a standstill. Everything is going basically up most of the time in the web. Traffic is going up. Requests are getting bigger. Uh, last week I saw a cookie, 20 kilobytes, a cookie, <laughs> and uh, a 20, by 20 kilobyte cookie on a modem line would take several seconds basically just to go back and forth, and uh, a cookie gets sent every time you click somewhere on the page, and uh, it. it it's insane, basically, and uh, but people do that stuff. Yeah, it's just it's madness. And uh, so, in, in a megabytes, it's not really so even get to megabytes. Yeah, yeah, sure. They can get to the megabytes for some bizarre reason, really, because they say, well, it's just an in-house application, and we've got uh, Ethernet everywhere, so it should be fast. But then you just open up some VPN to some uh, some guy giving you some things for to build your products basically and they need access to that application and then the application doesn't work anymore for a lot of a bizarre reason yeah. so um, in, in scaling point of view just you have to look uh, at the right mixture you could you can you could uh, use uh, host based stuff uh, you can uh, use the right hardware scale the right hardware make sure that your vendor provides you with an upgrade path for bigger hardware so don't buy something and just turn around and go away. Just look at it and how it will develop in the future. Will it scale in the future? Is there a potential problem? Do they uh, use uh, actually hardware acceleration, for example, in this box <coughs> and things like that? And the other thing is kind of the false positive. When, when you do the switch over from the monitoring mode to kind of uh, inline mode, or you can say kind of your that's up to you, basically, and uh, it's uh, a steep learning curve to begin with. If nobody did deal with uh, application security at all in a company, if they're new to the field, it's like uh, trying to get on a bike and, and cycle uh, and downhill on your mountain bike, basically. Nice. 
you you're able to cycle now you can go through you can go through manhattan even not being run over but uh, downhilling is something completely different you have to learn that yeah, operationalizing kind of the overhead as you as you think about like even we have put some applications we are still in the monitoring mode just putting it in the actual kind of blocking mode it's a big uphill thing because as soon as i put it in the blocking mode and a customer calls and says okay i'm not able to access it it becomes kind of yeah. Exactly. We deal with that in, in the paper later, and in, in basically uh, uh, saying that you need a special person for that. Or <coughs> if you're bigger, then you need several special pe uh, people for that. Um, uh, some kind, uh, some kind of new guy basically in the company, which is dealing with that, at least in a big corporate. So okay. Uh, this is uh, also a table in, in the paper, uh, uh, protection against the OWASP top 10, and uh, it just tells you uh, where you can fix stuff in the application versus the application firewall versus some policy you can set. And uh, uh, we said to start with, we started with uh, three types of application. One application is in the de design phase, so it's just on paper now, or on the whiteboard. Uh, uh, application two is already productive uh, and can easily be, be, be changed because you probably wrote it or it has is written in, in some modern model, model view controller architecture or type 3 it's a productive application and you cannot modify or uh, only with difficulty modify the whole thing because you just bought the thing like SAP or something like that. <coughs> so we go through the uh, always to uh, table top 10 uh, in, re in regards to work required with three types of application to fix the problem. So uh, in the application itself, or uh, using the web, or using the, uh, the policy. So I'm not talking about the table itself. Just look at the paper, um, and uh, you get all the information in there. It, it Sorry, when you say using a policy, you mean an administrative policy? Yeah, you can say, well, that, that's not allowed using. Oh, okay. uh, so administrative yeah. Then there's a minus in there. So it can't be dealt with. So, you, for example, uh, secure, secure storage example. It's a policy to use secure storage. It can be only be enforced using a policy. Uh, the WAF can't help you at all. <coughs> okay, then uh, the criteria for deciding whether or not to use the application. So um, it's a company-wide criteria, basically, and uh, it. It goes further down the idea earlier in the paper in, in uh, prioritizing your applications. So it's the importance of the applica application for the success of the company. If the application is offline and you can't do any uh, customer business anymore, then probably you should use uh, security somewhere and uh, not just a web application firewall or not just app testing tools or not just network uh, networking firewalls. You just use everything and make uh, sure that you secure your application as best as possible because if that's offline, you've got a problem and no money probably as well. Then uh, you look at the number of applications. Um, sometimes it needs a policy to say, well, don't run off and implement your own web application file, uh, firewall, uh, your web application using PHP and then Python, and then Perl, and then Ruby. Uh, you need a company policy which says we implement web application using product XYZ or language XYZ, period. Otherwise, you've got a big overhead in managing the security of all those things. <coughs> and uh, complexity comes with that, of course. Then operational costs. Um, have a look at what vendors try to charge you for all their products. So you can buy a WAF really cheap, but maybe it's, it, turn out, it turns out to be really expensive after you try to change hardware and something like that. And uh, performance and scalability, something you mentioned already. So have a close look to that. So have you seen cases where companies have built their web apps uh, securely enough that they don't need web application firewalls? No, not really. No. Um, they think they did, but it's, it's a pr uh, yeah, they're proud of their applications. And uh, if somebody's proud of something, then it's, it's hard to actually talk against it and say, well, look at this. Right? You show them some problem. I did a talk on the university, and they had a, 
a tool to manage all their students and the students can look into it and uh, what uh, uh, um, how they did basically in their certifications and stuff like that and had a big problem you could uh, turn it basically from an F into an A it's, it's just it was one get request and I showed him that online while he was really proud about his uh, application he said well uh, okay I can fix it within two minutes and he said okay no problem but what happens if somebody does that while you're on holiday uh, well then I fix it after that. I've got a log where everybody changed it. So then good luck in going through the log file where everybody changed this FT into an A. So it's, it's not a solution. Yeah. Yeah, another thing kind of on this question is the, the one argument is you cannot protect what you don't see. So even if you think you have the best web application, but if you're putting it, it's lying on the internet, you don't know who is attacking it because you don't have the visibility at the web application. Devices even help you to monitor or even know that what kind of attacks are coming. Also, you can only protect the code that you write. So Very important. You can't protect the code Microsoft or from anybody else. Yes. Okay. Yeah. 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 Ye
neat one, but not as hard as uh, the top right one guy if you just have external applications with no access to anything. And uh, uh, they have problems as well somewhere. So it, you bought some, let, let's for example say you bought the SAP portal and uh, it's brand new and SAP or some consultant did the implementation for you. Um, they work on a tight budget, so they don't secure it for you. It's probably good for you implementing a replication firewall. Good question, I haven't thought of that. Depends on the traffic flowing through probably. If it's uh, mainly SSL encrypted or encrypted traffic, maybe, maybe not. If you terminate stuff on the firewall, probably a uh, good idea to have one and not uh, leave the guys in charge and behind. Basically every application does its own termination. Uh, there could be some faulty implementation of SSL flying around using some old open SSL library or something like that. Maybe, I'm not sure, just guessing here. Would you ever recommend going without a network firewall? Uh, no. <laughs> and why, is, why would you recommend going without a web application firewall? Uh, I'm not recommending it because uh, not having a web application firewall mm -hmm. would stop here. Yeah. I, I actually heard that Microsoft doesn't have their web servers behind a web firewall. Yeah, the, the firewall wouldn't hold the traffic, basically. It's too much traffic. They've got gigabits flowing in. Uh, maybe they don't want to spend the money as well. So. Uh, <laughs> it sounds like if you're really careful how you configure your servers, then you could get away with not having a network firewall. You could get. It depends on you. It's, it's always about, uh, it's not about technology most of the time. It's about, 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 the, pe uh, about the people and how committed they are to security. You can drive your car without doors, but it's probably not a good idea. You can do it with kind of the architecture. <laughs> I can see a web server with just port 80 and harder just sitting and you don't need a firewall. Firewall, firewall is just restricting all other ports other than 80 or 443. So if you can do achieve it in the box and push it out and still keep your database inside, then that would be one architecture. Okay, I have to speed up a little because it's uh, already 8.45 and I think I've got only 45 minutes. So uh, um, best practices basically in operation introduction is uh, have a look in the uh, infrastructure. So centralized or uh, decentralized infrastructure, central proxy application, host-based yeah, plugin approach, whatever you like. Uh, do you want to virtualize your appli uh, application firewall? You can if you like, but have a look at performance and configuration of the a virtualizing, a virtualizing uh, infrastructure as well. So make sure they have enough resources available if they need it. Uh, then performance, uh, gigabits per second throughput on hardware does actually not matter. Most of the time it's uh, requests processed per second, uh, simultaneous uh, users basically on the application. And uh, think of peak load times, like pre-Christmas, and, and plan for that ahead as well. Then uh, organizational aspects, security policies, really try, don't try to change any security policies which are already in place is hard work and uh, it just ends up in a lot of discussions you don't want and uh, they don't help you implementing a replication firewall. And uh, suggest a new job position, basically get a new guy in. This is one guy we are suggesting in the paper, uh, and web application uh, manager. Uh, he has a, the one-off task basically of commissioning a replication firewall. He should have uh, knowledge, in-depth knowledge of the application capability, uh, capabilities. Uh, not just the one he buys, uh, actually all of them if, if possible. Uh, alarm and error management, uh, management is very important. Um, log management as well, if you do a central logging. Uh, and uh, he should do the changes to the rule set. One guy in charge, basically. And he should also do the talking to the development department. So they should be big buddies, actually. They, are, they aren't in the b to, to begin with, because it's some guy basically trying to get security in, and uh, he's annoying them somehow. But if, uh, if they have tools which are working together, like uh, source code analysis tools, which is able to export uh, rules for a application firewall, they probably uh, make their lives easier. So. What are the steps in, uh, in the introduction of a replication firewall? Step one is basically define all the people responsible. 
uh, ideally have a web application uh, manager for that. Uh, implement the baseline security. Uh, most of the time, it's a lot of blacklisting using vendor signatures. Uh, monitor false positives and get rid of them. It's really important. Just use the, uh, the logging mode. And uh, step three, uh, just look at your prioritized list uh, of all the applications which need to be secured. And uh, we've got a checklist uh, uh, as an appendix on the paper which helps you to prioritize. You just get points basically out and, and sum them up and say, well, okay, this is the first one we should do. Why and go why through that. Why would you do more than baseline? Sorry? Why would you do more than baseline? <laughs> yeah. Because it depends on uh, how secure you want to be. If uh, you don't want to, if, if you don't care about security, maybe baseline is too much for you. If you dependent on uh, the revenue of the company, uh, of the application, or the whole company is uh, dependent on that, you probably my problem. not always. No, what, what if it does? Then you're fine probably if it, if it solves your problem. Yeah. But most of the I, I never seen I've never seen an implementation where baseline protection was enough. So have a look at it. Just don't shut your eyes. Run around yeah, open-minded. Yeah, I, I can see kind of baseline is required, but especially when you have multiple applications developed in multiple technologies with multiple risk levels. <laughs> You've got a lot of work <laughs> <laughs> implementing that. Um, and then first step, just walk through the list you made and uh, finish it. So appendices for the paper were the checklist to define accessibility of the application. Uh, then job descriptions for the new guys, so there are actually uh, three. It's uh, the web, uh, web application platform manager. Uh, he's only needed in uh, really complex big, uh, big environments because he's the guy overlooking the whole security from a web application point of view. Um, and then the web application manager itself could be per application even. Um, sometimes it is a project manager but uh, project managers have to grow into that because they need to be able to talk really te technical stuff with their developers and get the rules out and implement the rules. It's not up to the developer getting the rules basically into the web application firewall, it's up to the, the web application manager. And you can have a application manager as well, which is interacting with uh, the web application manager. Most of the time, this guy is actually the project manager. He doesn't know technical stuff about that, but he knows that he needs some web application firewall protection somehow in his application. And he can basically tunnel information from the developers to the web application manager guy. So where to find the whole thing? It's uh, on the OWASP uh, wiki, of course. and. Um, you can download it as a PDF, and um, I think in it's not uh, automatically generated out of the wiki page. So we started with a paper actually in German, and uh, uh, put that online, and then I presented that paper on uh, OWASP Europe um, early that year, and um, we got a translation out. And after finishing that translation, now it's paper version 1.2 or something like that, uh, we set up the wiki page so everybody who wants to contribute can contribute. Yeah, I'm done. So that's it. So if you have any further questions, just talk to me after.